South Florida. This is Headliners, only on CBS News Miami. Hi there and welcome to Headliners. I'm Lauren Pastrana. The book battle in Florida schools rages on. A new report says public schools have pulled more books from class shelves than in any other state. CBS News Miami's Joan Murray looks into the impact on South Florida students. He tore his lips from it happened at this week's Broward School Board meeting. Speakers objecting to certain books found in school libraries. We need to remove pornographic materials from the uh, from the school. I won't read you this because we've already had three X rated. New state laws allow parents to challenge books and Broward 17 titles have been reviewed. Three removed from schools, the rest moved to a different age level. A ballpark, I would say Right now, I probably have about 50. Corey Pinero is with Moms for Liberty, an advocacy group for parental rights. We have rated system for our movies. We don't have a rated system for our books. At the board meeting, Brenda Pham expressed support for the objectionable books. And I'd like to know if that's in any of our libraries because I'm glad that you declared it inappropriate. In Miami-Dade, the school district said no library books have been removed, but three titles have been moved to a different grade level. The Florida Parent Teachers Association earlier this year wrote they objected to many of the new education laws governing libraries, saying they may trigger attempts to impose school site censorship. These books are not being banned from the schools. That is something that it's a narrative that we, we do not agree with. You can go and check these books out at the library, the county library, that's what I do. When there's a challenge in a book, I go and check it out and, and I read it for myself. And, or you can buy them at Amazon. It's about a parent choosing. We're gonna be hearing a lot more about public school library books from now until the end of the year. Here in Broward, they've set up a whole committee made up of parents, teachers, and librarians who will be weighing in on whether a book is appropriate. In Fort Lauderdale, Joan Murray, CBS News, Miami. Some citizens insurance policyholders are getting letters telling them a private insurance company will pick up their home insurance policy for their next renewal. And some people are not happy with their new premium. So what are their options? CBS News Miami's Yvonne Taylor worked to get answers. 20% is the figure you need to remember. That is what will determine if you stay with a citizen's insurance policy or you go to a private firm. Nancy Morales received the notification she feared. I'm very concerned. I'm very alarmed. It's a letter sent by Citizens Property Insurance Corporation. Morales is part of the thousands of homeowners whose home insurance policy has been picked up by a private insurer. Last December, state legislators sought to push policies into the private sector to lower the amount of policyholders by citizen, which is supposed to be the insurer of last resort, but the firm has become the state's largest insurer with more than one million policies. The problem is that the other company is almost $3,000 more a year. The letter stated her yearly policy was $5,182. Renewing with a private company would increase to more than 8000 I am stuck now with a policy that is almost double. My first response would be don't panic. We reach out to Citizens Insurance Policy. The spokesperson, Michael Pertier, said it's all about the math. If a policy comes in and it's within 20% of what your citizen's renewal rate would be, then you don't have to take that policy, but you will be ineligible to stay with citizens. So we did the math with Nancy, her old yearly premium. And we're going to multiply that times 20%. It's 103640 plus 5182. That comes out to like $6,218. Because the offer is more than 20% higher than what her citizens' renewal premium would be, she has the option to stay with us. How do you feel? I'm so relieved. I definitely want to remain with citizens. Citizens Insurance reminds you to be on the lookout for a letter or an email from them. You have 30 days to respond. If he or she does not do it, citizens interpret that as if you are going to go with a private firm. In Southwest Miami-Dade, Ivan Taylor, CBS News, Miami. September is National Suicide Prevention Month. According to the World Health Organization, it's estimated there are currently more than 700,000 suicides a year 
worldwide. And we know that each one profoundly affects many more people. One local woman is sharing her story of how her life changed and when she asked for help. Ted Scouten reports. It's probably been three years since I was actively suicidal, which has been rad to not feel that way anymore. Sarah Peshka is in training to become a crisis counselor. She's drawing on her own experience to help others. Around the ages of 14 through 16, I had two distinct attempts. And then since then, um, I've struggled with a lot of suicidal thoughts and ideation. Um, it's only been probably the past two or three years that I've really felt like I've turned a corner with that. Her life changed when she asked for help. And I just didn't see a way out of it other than to, to commit suicide. Um, and eventually through a lot of really good therapists and a lot of, a lot of hard work um, through them and on my part, I finally got to a point where I don't feel like that's how my life is going to end anymore. People in isolation do not do well with their mental health. James Phillips is a licensed therapist and CEO of Above Therapeutic Services. He says a key to good mental health is connection. When we have a, a genuine connection with somebody, like me and you sit here and talk, it's us talking about a shared interest in producing dopamine and serotonin, and these are the neurotransmitters that makes us feel good. And that's part of the all-important self-care. Maybe I want to open up my morning with some meditation. That's going to be helpful. Also, maybe that morning I want to make sure that I have contact with a friend, maybe call him up on the phone on the way to work. Sarah makes time to care for herself daily. I have a little bit of anxiety, so I do a lot of uh, breathing exercises. I'm big on being outdoors, uh, that's one of the things recently that's really, really helped me is exercise and getting outside. If you or someone you know is struggling, help is just a phone call away at 988, the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. Ted Scouten, CBS News, Miami. When we come back, see what's being done to save our coral reefs from the devastating effects of climate change. South Florida, this is Headliners, only on CBS News Miami. Welcome back, I'm Lauren Pastrana. Florida's coral reef is still feeling the fallout from this summer's record ocean heat. Local experts say the unprecedented coral bleaching event prompted them to spring into action, not only to save the existing coral, but to teach them how to help the reef be better prepared for more summers of record heat. Next weather meteorologist Dave Warren has the story. So that really sounded the alarm for us, that we could literally lose all of our corals, thousands of corals have been growing over the last decade from this single bleaching event, which meant we had to act. Act, and act fast, because the alarm sounding was caused by record ocean temperatures in the Keys and South Florida. For Dalton Hesley and his researchers at the University of Miami's Rosensteel School, those near 100 degree water temperatures were more than an inconvenience. It caused this. Bleached coral like this site here in Biscayne Bay, it's seven years of restoration that showed signs of stress and even death. It's something we've seen before, but never like this. Typically, this bleaching event happens over weeks, but we've seen these corals essentially cooked in a matter of days, um, which is extremely alarming. It was necessary to actually launch a full-scale coral rescue to build essentially a land-based arc to protect these corals from this extreme heat that they're experiencing. The rescued coral making its way back here to the campus at Key Biscayne, where it's kept under the watchful eye of Cameron McMath. We offer them a place to have a, a, a safe haven from some of the temperature stresses that they're going through. Um, but we also accommodate all of the research that's being done on these corals by the University of Miami students. It's research in addition to protecting the coral in these tanks that will be key to ensuring the reef not only survives, but grows. And even though you may not see it, it doesn't mean it doesn't play an important role here in South Florida. Losing corals to an event like this through coral bleaching has an extremely dire impact on both the ecosystems and the communities that depend on them. We aren't just talking about divers exploring the beauty of the living reef. There's also benefits from what they leave behind. Corals are a living animal that actually create framework that marine organisms call home, protect our coastlines, support our economy. It's not just protecting the corals in these tanks that's important, but helping them better adapt. It's a solution to an ever-growing problem created by rising ocean temperatures. Over the coming months, we're going to continue to monitor and better understand just how impactful this bleaching event was, what corals might have been most resistant. It's 
take those corals, the ones that have that toughness to them, we're going to start growing them a little bit more quickly, and those are the ones that we're really going to be keen on putting out on the reefs again. Because with climate change and a warming ocean, bleaching events will become more common and intense. These researchers don't want to be the only ones fighting to save them. The norm has shifted, and we need to start thinking about how do we scale up coral gardening and reef restoration, couple it with research while getting social action involved. We're a small team, and this is a big event. That's corals like these in these tanks right here that are collected, protected, and studied in hopes that when they do return to the ocean very soon, they'll be more adapt to deal with the changing climate and the warming ocean. At the University of Miami Rosensteel School, I'm Dave Warren for CBS News Miami. Now, an all-new Miami Proud with a nod to Hispanic Heritage Month. The story of the Bay of Pigs invasion is woven into the fabric of South Florida, but with time, we're losing more and more veterans of that operation. CBS News Miami's Hank Tester shows us how two local museums are scrambling to preserve their history. Big plans for a $2 million expansion of Little Havana's Bay of Pigs Museum. That's Rafael Montalvo, president of the Bay of Pigs Veterans Association, along with Carlos Luis, president of the museum and library. Montalvo is a Bay of Pigs veteran. Luis is the son of a veteran of the April 1961 CIA-sponsored attempt to overthrow the Cuban regime, headed by Fidel Castro. A great deal of the new museum is going to be audiovisual. Telling the story of the landing on the south coast of Cuba at the Bay of Pigs. A force of 1,500 Cuban volunteers determined to take back their country. A gallant yet failed effort that ended in prison for a majority of the landing force, death for others. That's the message here, that, that freedom is worth dying for and offering your life for. And it's a race against time. Many of the Bay of Pigs veterans are now elderly in their 80s, and some are not doing well. Felix Rodriguez heads the Crosstown City-sponsored Hialeah Gardens Museum honoring the Brigade 2506. Now we are getting individual here, younger, that we are going to train uh, to be able to give a tour of this museum with the scene that we know. So they will be able, when we are no longer around, they will be able to give a tour of everything that is inside this museum. And there's plenty to see in the city-sponsored museum that has the feel of a Cuban home. Broad windows, an atrium full of lots of pictures, weapons, memorabilia, outside a tank from the era, and an A-26 used in the operation. What's it like for you to, to watch children and grandchildren of the veterans coming through here. It's a great personal satisfaction to be able to provide that for them. Two museums scrambling to tell the story and challenged by Father Time. Of the original members of the entire Brigade 2506 operation. There's probably 300 left and you know half of them have the beginning of dementia. Are you sitting down with these guys, videotaping them and asking them to tell their story? We have. We have uh, over 110 uh, veterans which we videotaped, right? And we're going to make sure that we go ahead and display them in our new museum. If you want information on how to visit these two museums, take a look at our website. That's cbsmiami.com. In Hialeah Gardens, I'm Hank Tester, CBS News, Miami. When we come back, a South Florida music legend is giving back to the school that helped his dreams become a reality. Stay with us. South Florida, this is Headliners, only on CBS News Miami. Welcome back, I'm Lauren Pastrana. Exciting times for some kids in Miami Gardens. They met some special guests in class. A couple Miami Dolphins football players spent the day with students in their after-school STEM workshop. CBS News Miami's Trish Christakis has the story. So this, this is the one we're going to try and practice. We just need the robot. Players from the Dolphins, including Alec Ingold, Skylar Thompson, Eli Apple, all came together this week to spend some time with the STEM students at the Seek Foundation. I got to explain what the thing was to them and how, how 
how did how to do it. They spent the day learning how to code and build these robotics, something the kids loved teaching and competing with the players. We were able to compete with our robots we have built for this past week and the week before that. We were, we were able to compete, we were able to race each other with different teams. I learned a ton. I've never coded before in my life. Uh, we had to make sure it was in the words, not the blocks, because I did not understand the shapes. They were, it was extremely confusing. The kids taught me up quick. Um, and then we had that fun race at the end, which I'm glad my team was able to come home with the win. The Seek Foundation's purpose is to empower the youth to help provide opportunities for these kids to build products and develop skills through these after-school STEM programs. Take myself back to when I was a kid and, you know, how I looked up to, to people that, you know, played in a league or, you know, did special things and, in life and being able to look up to that and see that but you know for us to be able to come back and be a part of their special day and see what they're doing and, and make them feel special I think is really important and really cool. Now most of these students are wanting to be engineers when they grow up and it's evident in their skills they showed while putting together these robotics. So having NFL stars encourage their skills was a big moment for them. It's a blessing because some some kids don't really have that ability to meet different people around the world and what they do. So I think it's a real blessing. Of course, they ended the day with Dolphins merch and autographs to tip off an already memorable day. In Miami Gardens, Trish Christakis, CBS News, Miami. Rapper and entrepreneur Rick Ross is giving back to high school kids who now sit in the same seats he once did. His first stop was Miami Norland Senior High School. He then went to his alma mater, Miami Carroll City, where he played football. Ross says it's important that children meet successful people so they know they can do it too. This was just another way he's helping his hometown. CBS News Miami's Tanya Francois has more. Rapper Rick Ross, the boss, Mr. Rose, knows a thing or two about hustling. His business portfolio also includes restaurants like Wingstop and Rallies. He has an alcohol and rose line. New is this partnership with a denim brand. And in between all these hustles, there's his passion for giving back. Giving back to your community is always the cool thing. He's given away haircuts, shoes, and back to school supplies to area kids. We watched him pull cash out of his pockets and give to students who are trying to go to college from his old high school and neighborhood. Community is also where the now Star Island resident's heart is. You, you determine how big of a boss you are by how many people you bless. You know what I mean? So let's have a good time. Ross says giving is also how he receives. It helps him rejuvenate. It frees his mind to balance work while enjoying the fruits of his labor. You go so hard, sometimes you don't even give yourself time to enjoy it because I love what I do. So I don't even consider it hard work because I look forward to going to the studio, meet, sitting down with a young creative producer with a dream who I believe in. To me, that's the real. Ross has never forgotten where he comes from. Carroll City, Miami Gardens. It's who he is and you see it all over his music. It's what someone poured into him and it gave him the confidence to make it. It's a debt he says he owes to the future to do the same for someone else. City of Miami Gardens Council and Reggie Leon grew up with Ross. It's always important to that generation behind us that's, that's constantly watching and see that we're paving, somebody paved the way for us. So now we have to continue to pave the way for our children. Ross is in the middle of remodeling his brand new home on Star Island. His next hustle isn't far away. He says now is the best time to be creative and he's looking forward to working with the next big producer. In the newsroom, Tanya Francois, CBS News, Miami. Thanks for joining us this half hour on Headliners. As always, keep it right here to CBS News Miami for up to the minute breaking news and weather 24 hours a day. Make it a great one.